Hello and welcome to today's session. We are continuing to look at this play, the piano lesson. It will be important to understand the historical context in order to appreciate the uh, play and the many imports that it's trying to convey. So it's set in 1936 Pittsburgh and it's also in the immediate aftermath of the Great Depression. So we find that it's a uh, society which is uh, uh, you know, right after depression, there's an economic crisis, there's also a shift in a number of trends in the sociological attitudes, in the uh, kind of ideologies which will begin to change. So it's also a time which is very, very important in the racial politics of America. So we find that the African American community, they begin to uh, witness a massive change in a large scale when the blacks begin to migrate in uh, from the south towards the north of America. And as we know, the south is very regressive. It's uh, uh, the, the uh, racism is, uh, uh, the racial attitudes are deep seated in the south. So this uh, migration um, in some sense, which uh, it results in a, in the emergence of a new black community in the north. And uh, they were in, in, in uh, forced to live in poverty. But at the same time, there's some positive aspect to this movement, to this migration from the south towards the north. That is something that uh, August Wilson also manages to highlight in this play. Uh, because this northward uh, movement promised a certain kind of freedom, the liberty that uh, the blacks never had access to in the south. This is depicted in the characters of Limon and uh, Avery, who decide to, uh, you know, who take this decision to settle down in the north because it seems like more uh, liberating more uh, promising, though, you know, the prospects in a material sense seem to be uh, lesser than what is there in the South. So this is something very interesting, which uh, could be noticed as a contrast to the uh, way in which the non-black communities in America would look at freedom, would uh, want to look at material uh, prosperity. And this also essentially the identity, the markers of identity that also determines the way in which they look at notions of freedom and the way in which they define success. So this play also throws light on the uh, the convict lease, lease system and the Mississippi State Penitentiary. The convict lease system was something that began right after the end of the Civil War in the 19th century. And uh, it was the state of Mississippi was with st which started with this system. And uh, through this, the prisoners were uh, leased private railways, mines, and large plantations in order to give them a chance to rebuild their life. So while the state earned the profit, the prisoners uh, earned uh, uh, no pay and they also ended up facing inhuman dangerous work conditions. So theoretically, this was seen as something which would give them a better chance. But in reality, what happened was it forced them to live under uh, worse kind of situations, but uh, uh, this uh, in in a in a in a very uh, organic, but uh, in a very inhuman sense too, it contributed to the overall material success and development of uh, the nation. But this system led to the entrapment of a high rate of black males, even uh, for minor or false offenses, because that was also seen as cheap labor. The prisoners could directly be made to work on uh, this, uh, you know, in these uh, in the private railways and mines and large plantations for very cheap labor. So there was an increase in, uh, in, in the black males who were getting arrested, who were getting imprisoned. And they were often, you know, uh, wrongly accused of high rate crimes and they were then forced to work under very harsh labor conditions. And they also struggled a number of years before they could get out and some never could get out either. And uh, this uh, program eventually uh, was stopped by the late 19th century in uh, 1894 because of the increased rate of corruption. But it was restarted in 1904 and it was again uh, you know, the, the prisoners were leased this, uh, uh, leased out for uh, cheap labor, uh, particularly in the Mississippi state. And this system, unfortunately, continued till the end of uh, Second World War. And we find that generations of black men were trapped in the system. So why is this important for our understanding of this play? In the play, Doka Charles, the uncle who owns uh, the, the family now, the family household and who is uh, living with uh, Bernice, uh, with whom uh, Bernice is living, we find that you know, he recalls his days working in railroads as part of this system. So this history is very important to identify a certain trajectory which is otherwise untold in the history of uh, uh, the American state. So uh, it, uh, this system was also known as, you know, this system through which uh, the uh, black prisoners 
sometimes you know these false prisoners came through it was also known as a parchment farm it was a maximum security prison farm and it started in 1901 by the state of mississippi and the inmates worked on the prison farm and also in manufacturing workshops so there were three uh, separate uh, farms under the parchment farm which was also you know began to be euphemistically used as a term for prison it had three separate farms a small farm for white prisoners the smallest one for uh, women prisoners and a huge plantation for black prisoners and they were of course needless to say the vast majority of the convicts so in his uh, book uh, worse than slavery the parchment and the ordeal of jim crow justice david oshenke uh, talks about the history of this farm and he states that it was the closest thing to slavery that survived the civil war so in some sense the presence of the parchment farm and the integration of that into a play like this it's also telling us that the the practice of slavery it did not essentially uh, end with the civil war it continued in different forms the vocabulary uh, uh, changed but it continued in different other forms like you know the parchment farm or the uh, the convict lease system which uh, was also to you know uh, give some sort of uh, it, it was like whitewashing the um, the entire system of slavery and giving it a different name but the conditions under which uh, the 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 practices uh, continued it remained the same in so many ways so um oshinki also discusses about the various uh, discriminations so racial discriminations and the inhuman practices which uh, uh were meted out to the black prisoners in uh within the prison so uh, in in the play also we find that willie and uh, limon they are sent to prison for stealing wood and this may seem like a petty crime but they are given a very severe treatment uh in in return for this so the major themes uh, when we look through this play the major themes which begin to emerge are memory and historical legacy racism and self determination the notion of spirituality and the dichotomy between grief and hope and the uh, and and the uh, emotions of love and the other relationships that the characters experience in the course of the play to get a detailed sense of the background the historical context the sociological trajectory that this uh, play uh, portrays uh, we may have to look at uh, a few instances right from the beginning where we get uh, a lot of insights into the times so we had stopped at this uh, uh, play, uh, this instance where uh, bernie refuses to uh, believe what limon had uh, and limon and boy willy were telling them about how uh, doka died that now and uh, she refuses to take them for um uh, no, she refuses to take their words uh, for truth and then we also get a glimpse of what had gone wrong in their own family history in their own family life so now bernie is refers to Uh, uh, uh her husband her dead husband crawley in this context a uh, boy will i want you and lemon to go ahead and leave my house just go on somewhere you don't do nothing but bring trouble with you everywhere you go it would, if it wasn't for you crawley would still be alive crawley what i ain't had nothing to do with crawley getting killed crawley 3 times 7 he had his own mind and bernie is again you know is refusing to engage with that while willie continues i'm leaving soon as we sell them watermelons other than that i ain't go nowhere hell i just got here talking about sutter looking for me sutter was looking for that piano that's what he was looking for so this is also that turn right after that instance where uh, bernie begins to complain that she actually saw uh, sutter's ghost upstairs so uh, here boy willie is using that to his advantage to say say that uh, you know sutter is perhaps looking for the piano and uh, he had to die to find out where that piano was at if i was you i'd get rid of it that's a way to get rid of sutter's ghost get rid of that piano he's trying to use that to his advantage by saying sutter now that he has found where the piano is and he also had to die you know this there's, there's a lot of um, subtle dark comedy over here he could never find out where that piano was when he was alive now that he's a ghost he has figured it out and if bernie's were to get rid of um, sutter's ghost Uh, she has to uh, sell the piano and get rid of that. And Bernice thinks that it was uh, Boy Willie who had uh, brought this entire uh, contingent of confusion into her house, and she keeps asking them to leave. 
and uh, they, they, they just uh, go back and forth in this conversation with uh, uh, both of them staying stubborn, be feeling stubborn about their own um, uh, uh, positions with Bernie's wanting them to leave and not wanting to sell the piano and uh, uh, Boyerly claiming that it's his share as well and he has every right to sell it. Limon and Boyerly have a conversation about this and Boyerly also you know, tries, tries to rationalize this saying, it's all in her head, there ain't no ghost up there. And uh, Hidoka, I told you, ain't nothing up there. And he also says, I wish I could see Sutter's ghost. Give me a chance to put a whipping on him. So there is, uh, the, 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 the family members seem to be reacting in different ways to the presence and to the mention of uh, uh, Sutter. I ain't thinking about Sutter. I ain't thinking about staying up here. You stay up here. I'm going, I'm going back and get Sutter's land. You think I ain't got to work up here. You think this is the land of milk and honey, but I ain't scared of work. I'm going back and farm every acre of that land. So this is uh, Le uh, Boy Willie telling Limon, who wants to stay back there, stay in uh, uh, the in this land where uh, he thinks, you know, there is more prospects and more freedom more than anything. I told you there ain't nothing up there, Joker, Bernie's dreaming, all that. I believe Bernie's seen something. Bernie's level-headed. She will not make up such things. So they are having uh, this conversation about what sort of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of experiences they have all had. And in this, through this, we get a sense of their own identity and how they are responding to different life situations. Now, this is an instance where Doker is beginning to give them an account, rather unsolicited account, of the 27 years that he had spent uh, know, working with the railroads. And uh, this, uh, you know, it, it's a very long, uh, uh, long winding kind of ramble which he begin, gets started with. And if you could uh, quickly read through it, I'll tell you something about the railroad. What I'd done, learned after 27 years. See, you got north, you got west, you look over here, you got south, over there you got east. Then we can start from anywhere, don't care where you are at. Yeah, And it's, it's about this meaninglessness of this travel, meaninglessness of this work and him trying to make sense of uh, out of all this, you know, through this ramble. Why people going, their sister's sick, they're leaving before they uh, kill somebody. So here we find that these documentations, these uh, uh, documentation of these uh, job descriptions are very important over here. Here we find Doka speaking at length about the work that he had done, the contributions that he had made to America and we do not find the family reaping returns of it in any visible ways over here. It's also about the documentation of a history which is otherwise absent in the other, other chronicles and the other narratives. And this sort of a detailing again is very important because this part of history is also from where they draw uh, energy for their identity. It's also from where, you know, they uh, the, it, it, the, the suffering and the trauma which is also inherently part of this, it's also something which is very vital to their, uh, in, in, in order to mark their identity. Yeah. So he continues in this ramble and Boy Willie has to uh, interrupt and distract him uh, with uh, the mention of you know cooking and uh, food. Uh, but what here is uh, very striking is that uh, in these instances, now where Doker is talk, talking about his railroad experience and later uh, when uh, Avery, you know, who wants to be a preacher and who is currently working as an, uh, an, 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 you know, an elevator uh, assistance, assistant, he, we find that uh, in, in both their lives, in these descriptions, there are a lot of unsaid elements, unspoken elements, which uh, perhaps would be helpful to fill in those gaps, the historiographical gaps in mainstream. Um, the narratives about uh, America. So, uh, and there's another significant instance in uh, Act 1, Scene 1 itself over here where a lot of uh, stage setting is also being done. Uh, Boy Willie is uh, meeting Marita. This is uh, Bernice's daughter, his uh, uh, niece, and they're meeting for the first time and he is trying to have a conversation with her, largely about the piano. So um, he's trying to sound, Limon is also trying to sound very overtly familiar with you know, Maretha saying, you look like, uh, you look just like your mama. I remember you when you were wearing uh, diapers. Yeah? While uh, uh, Limon does not get a, a fair idea about, you know, what, what kind of conversation to have with this 11 year old girl, Boyvili seems to get it right by uh, straight away diving into the topic of the piano. 
So here we find that no matter what happens, Boyle is always focused on bringing up this subject, you know, bringing up uh, this object, which seems to be the definitive marker of the play, their identity, and uh, a way in which, you know, it's an entry point for all of them to begin talking about an unspeakable past. So, Boy Willie uh, starts his conversation with Marita. Uncle Toka tells uh, me, your mama got you playing that piano. Come on, play something for me. So, show me what you can do here. Uncle Boy uh, will he give you a dime. Show me what you can do. Don't be bashful now. And uh, she begins to play a piece which any beginner would uh, first play. And uh, Boy Willie... Um, interrupts her and wants to show her something else. He sits and plays a simple boogie woogie. See that? See what I'm doing? That's what you call the boogie woogie. See now you can get up and dance to that. That's how good it sounds. It sounds like you want to dance. You can dance to that. It'll hold you up. So what he is doing over here is trying to tell her that there are more natural uh, kind of rhythms, more intimate kind of rhythms that you cannot perhaps learn in which you cannot formally get trained, something that you acquire. And that is what he is trying to show her over here. And this incidentally perhaps is the only piano lesson that we would witness in this entire play which bears the title The Piano Lesson. So the other lessons in this play, the other initiations in this play are about, not centrally about music. It is about many other things that this piano begins to signify. This piano we also uh, mentioned in the previous uh, in one of the previous sessions that it's also the symbol which integrates both the black as well as the white cultures and which is why its uniqueness gets displayed in the carvings that it has on the piano. And so uh, sh uh, for Boy Willie, uh, here he sees the uh, piano as an object which is carrying um, music, a cultural vehicle that's carrying music which he believes would also come more organically, more intimately, more naturally to the black, uh, the African American community. And then, you know, he, of course, um, being the um, uh, kind of practical mercenary person that he is, he's immediately diverting her attention by also saying that Uncle Boy Willie is going to get you a guitar. You don't need to read no paper to play the guitar. Your mama told you about the piano. You know how they got pictures um, uh, on there. So, uh, in, in this in these snippets of conversation where he's not centrally, it's, he's actually not centrally talking about uh, music. He is uh, in, in some sense trying to wean the girl away from the piano uh, while also engaging in this conversation about music. And this whatever comes uh, up in this conversation is also something that he very naturally and very strongly believes in that um, you don't need a music sheet to learn music. It should be something that would come naturally to uh, a, a person because the way, you know, he's looking at the significance of music, it's a cultural vehicle which also is a marker of their identity in uh, some sense. So, so he now begins to ask her whether she knows about the piano, whether, uh, the, whether Maratha knows how those pictures, those carvings got there. So here now, Boyville is beginning to ask Mareta whether she knows how the pictures got there. And uh, Mareta says, she says, it has always been like that since she got it. You hear that, Doka? And you're sitting up here in the house with Bernice. I got nothing to do with her. I don't get in the way of Bernice is raising her. So look at the diverse ways in which each member in the family is responding to the question of identity. How much of that they want to own how much of this uh, past that they want to distance themselves from. Boyville, of course, does, uh, does not get into the details of uh, uh, what those pictures imply and how they are important for them at this moment. You tell your mama to tell you about that piano. You ask her how them got pictures on there. If she don't tell you, I'll tell you. Yeah. And then Marita is being called away by uh, Bernice and at this moment Avery enters and this is again you know another important uh, context over here. So um, Avery is 38 years old and he's honest and ambitious as the description goes here. He has taken to the city like a fish to water finding in it opportunities for growth and advancement that did not exist for him in the rural south. So the play also spells it out over here the difference between the south and the north the rural south and the more urban the fairly more urban north. 
there were, of course, um, maybe, you know, there is poverty, there is struggle in the North, but there is more advancement, there is more opportunities for growth. And the way they would want to look at freedom, advancement, material comfort and success, it's very different from the way perhaps, you know, uh, the non-black American uh, uh, you know, citizen would want to look at it. He is dressed in a suit and a tie with gold cross around his neck. He carries a small Bible. So there is a religion also comes in over here in a very different way which we will very soon see as well. So Avery is part of the church. He wants to become a preacher, but he's not distanced from the uh, others over here like one would conventionally expect out of any religious framework. So here, uh, Avery is talking about, you know, getting a loan to start the church and we do know that it's a very unconventional kind of uh, church establishment that they are talking about. It is not like, uh, a, a, you know, a, 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 an established church with uh, which uh, has everything set for it, uh, but this is uh, like a, a church which is, uh, uh, which needs uh, money to get it started, a church which needs people to get uh, started with. So, uh, we also get to know, um, uh, say, Boyle is asking, you know, Limon say preachers don't have to work. Where are you working at, Nika? So, this, in some sense, in uh, uh, this is a kind of a history, like we mentioned before, which is not documented in most other places. The trajectory, the sociological background, which is being traced over here, is a history from which uh, either one would want to distance oneself from or the history which does not get articulated in so many ways. So uh, he says he's working down there at the Gulf building, running an elevator, got, got a pension and everything. They even give you a turkey on Thanksgiving. So these are the descriptions of his uh, work, the job description. It gives again, you know, a sense of a very different history. That steel, they got steel cables holed up. They took a whole lot of uh, breaking to break that steel. No, I ain't worried about nothing like that. It ain't nothing but a little old elevator. Now, I wouldn't get in none of them airplanes. You couldn't pay me to do nothing like that. Yeah. So, uh, now, Boyhuli again, uh, you can see the kind of focused conversations that he has uh, in this play. Boyhuli straight away asks of how many watermelons do you want to buy? Yeah. So, it's entirely about pursuing his dream in some sense. It's entirely about uh, making enough money to buy Sutter's land as far as he's concerned. So, now, uh, Avery is telling them the story of, you know, how he decided to become a preacher and there is a and something that he says came to him in a dream. It came to me in a dream. God called me and told me he wanted me to be a shepherd for his flock. That's what I'm going to call my church, the Good Shepherd, Church of God in Christ. Yeah. So uh, now he is detailing the dream over here. See, I was sitting out in this uh, railroad, uh, railroad yard watching the trains go by. The train stopped and these three hobos got off. They told me they had come from Nazareth and was on their way to Jerusalem. So you find this, uh, you know, the, the waiting for Godo uh, images getting replicated over here, though in a very different way. And in this dream, the three candles and the three hobos, they are also, uh, they are, the allusions are also uh, to the wise men who appear in and the Bible at the time of uh, uh, Jesus' birth. So, next thing I knew, I was standing in front of this house. Something told me to go knock on the door. This old woman opened the door and said they had been waiting on me. She led me into this room. Yeah, so you can, you know, read through this uh, to get a sense of the details. They washed my feet, combed my hair. The Christian uh, allusions here, the allusions to the different uh, instances which happen in the uh, in biblical history, in the uh, New Testament history, it is uh, very, very clear over here. I went through one of them doors and the flame leapt off that candle and it seemed like my whole head caught fire. I looked around, there was four or five other men standing with the same blue robes on. The colors also here have a very strong religious significance. And then, you know, he tells the story, it, I knew then that I had been filled with the Holy Ghost, called to be a servant of the Lord, so I became a preacher. Here we find the Christian and the folk traditions merging together. And this is again a kind of historiography which is difficult to document, which is difficult to capture because it, uh, it comes together from diverse traditions, from diverse belief systems, from diverse uh, ideological stances. Uh, in the next scene, in scene 2 in Act 1, we also meet Whining Boy 
who wanted to make it big you know with his uh, uh, musical skills but it uh, does not uh, quite happen that way and with uh, him Docker is having this conversation where he also says that you know Docker believes that she's uh, messing around with Avery they got something going and that's just a sense that we get out of the play as well so uh, here the wh whining boy uh, you know he begins to talk about his past and about his uh, wife who is dead now and about the comfort that he had uh, when his wife was present even though he was uh, uh, you know separated from her and uh, because uh, when the Cleota his uh, wife used to comfort her saying you got a home as long as I got mine so this need for security the need for uh, a, a, a foundation it operates in a uh, in, in very unconventional and unique ways over here. So the way the characters define relationships, their expectations out of every relationship, their expectation out of family from uh, the individuals uh, with whom they are uh, interacting with, it's all very different. And it is all uh, very, uh, in, in, it's all steeped, very heavily steeped in the sense of past from which they are drawing uh, their identity, from which they are uh, no, based on which they are making their uh, decisions as well. Yeah? And um, uh, Boyle and uh, Limon at some point they also begin talking about how they, uh, you know, they, they uh, ended up in Parchment Farm. Uh, we did see, you know, what Parchment Farm stands for. It is actually a very euphemistic way of referring to the prison. Me and Limon was down there hauling wood for uh, Jen Miller and keeping us a little bit to sell. Some white fellows tried to run us off it. That's when Crawley got killed. They put me and Limon in the uh, penitentiary. Yeah. So this history is very important over here. What is being seen is stealing is uh, you know the way they define it is say they were hauling wood and they were keeping is keeping a little bit to themselves to sell and uh, this uh, of course you know gets them into a lot of trouble and in this process his brother-in-law Bernice's uh, husband gets killed as well the ambush is right there where the road uh, dipped down and around that bend in the creek Crawley tried to fight them me and boy Willie got away but the sheriff got us say if we were stealing wood they shot me in my stomach and look at the matter of fact way in which all of these details are being told uh, here and this is the uh, everyday reality that they are facing this is the ordinariness that they are living and uh, this uh, is certainly not part of the white history because it's very clearly I mentioned or uh, some white, white fellows try to run us uh, off of it yeah so uh, the race as a marker here becomes something which could potentially put them in danger as well the color of their skin becomes something which could uh, permanently damage them uh, emotionally scar them and also bring an end to their life that's how you know uh, their uh, lives have uh, shaped up as well so it's also a, way, a stark difference in the way in which they respond and negotiate with the white world um, Libon feels that he would uh, want to continue to stay up uh, st uh, stay in the uh, in the in north run not you know go back to the south because he thinks that they treat you up better here that uh, the blacks are treated better over here in the north but boy Willie has a very different response to it I ain't worried about nobody mistreating me they treat you like you let them treat you they mistreat and I mistreat them right back ain't no difference in me and the white man it's a very confident response coming from boy Willie it could be seen as bordering on a sense of um, uh, naive uh, experience as well and uh, whining boy also you know seems to agree with uh, 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 Limon in some sense when he says that the law is very different for the blacks and the whites yeah so uh, as he you know describes over here all right now Mr. So and so he sell the land to you and he come to you and say John you own the land it's all yours now but them is my berries and uh, come to pick them I'm going to send my boys over you got the land but them berries I'm going to keep them they are mine and he got to fix it with the law that them has his berries. Now that's the difference between the colored man and the white man. The colored man can't fix nothing with the law. So the law seems to be on the side of the white man. This is the 1930s, yeah, a 1930s Pittsburgh. And this is the kind of reality that they are talking about. And there are of course characters like Boy Willie, who seems to be full of optimism, seems to be full of confidence. And they think that 
it, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 one can change one's destiny. That's what he is setting off to do as well. But there are also, you know, there's this practical aspects coming out in the descriptions given by Docker and uh, uh, Whining Boy, where they say the colored man has a very different sense, gets a very different treatment from the law. Uh, I don't go by what the law says. The law's liable to say anything. I go by if it's right or not. It don't matter to me what the laws say. I take and look at it for myself. So his attitude is clearly very, very different. Boy Willie, the way he wants to look at life is as an individual. Here is where we find him uh, sitting in alignment with how the American dream also defines an individual. He, he is like just another white man who would want to claim his share of what belongs to him from that land. Just the way we saw in the previous play, uh, the uh, Raisin in the Sun as well. So um, now Wh Whining Boy used to play the piano and now he talks about how, you know, he, um, though the piano was the best, um, uh, though, you know, the piano was something that he was immensely drawn to, uh, eventually getting rid of the piano, stop the, you know, stopping his musical career was uh, the best thing that happened to him. So, um, and, and he also talks about this identity crisis. Now, who am I? Am I me or am I the piano player? Music plays a very important role in this play in uh, talking about, while talking about the history of uh, the community, while also talking about specific identity markers, which are, um, uh, which are important uh, for this uh, family as well. So, Boy Willie, as I mentioned before, he seems to be very focused on this aspect of uh, getting the piano uh, sold. That is what he wants to do. So, Boy Willie says she ain't going to sell it, but I'm going to sell it. Bernice ain't, Bernice ain't got no more rights to that piano that than I do. So, um, now we uh, with this, uh, we find that they're also entering a, a different style of conversation where the history of the piano is being told. So, this is also the piano lesson. The piano lesson uh, when you get deeper into this uh, play, we understand the piano lesson is actually about the history of the piano, which is also about the history of slavery, which is also about the history of slavery that this one particular family experienced and how that affected them as individuals and what kind of uh, things were at, uh, are at stake when they are either trying to own that history or trying to distance themselves from that history. We will bring this uh, discussion to a close, uh, uh, you know, with uh, uh, after having read some excerpts from this history, which is being revealed to us through Doka. Um, I'm talking to the man. Let me talk to the man to understand why we say that, to understand about that piano. You, could, you got to go back to the slavery time. The way in which the uh, the sense of time operates for the African American family, for the African American community, is the time, the before slavery time and after slavery time. That seems to be the division. Not that you know things had stopped entirely after the Civil War, as we also pointed out at the beginning of this um, uh, session. Uh, though slavery did not come to an end in a technical sense, there is a it's a, it's a historical divider too. Yeah. So uh, here, in order to understand the history of the piano, one needs to go back to the slavery time. See, our family was owned by a fellow named Robert Sutter. That was Sutter's grandfather. So this uh, reminiscence is very different from the kind of reminiscence that we would see in an Arthur Miller play. Um, so here, um, that was Sutter's grandfather. All right. The piano was owned by a fellow named Joel Nolander. He was one of the Nolander brothers from down in Georgia. It was coming up on Sutter's wedding anniversary. He was looking to buy his wife. Mr. Ophelia was her name. He was looking to buy her an anniversary present. Only thing with him, he ain't had no money. He had some niggers. Yeah. So that is, here is where the uh, significance of the piano is coming up. So he asked Mr. Nolander to see if maybe he could trade off some of uh, his niggers for that piano told him he would give him one and a half niggers for it. That's the way he told him. Say he could have one full grown and one half grown. Mr. Nolander agreed. Only he say he had to pick them. He didn't want such to give him just any old nigger. He say he wanted to have the pick of the litter. So Sutter lined up his niggers and Mr. Nolander looked them over and out of the whole bunch he picked my grandmother. His name was Bernice. Same like Bernice. And he picked my daddy when he was nothing but a little boy, nine years old. They made the trade off and Miss Ophelia was so happy with the piano that it got to be just about all she would do was play on that piano. 
So time go, time to go along, Mansur Ophelia got to missing my grandmother and the way she would cook and clean the house and talk to her and what not. She missed having my daddy around, so she asked to see if uh, maybe she could trade back the piano and get the niggers back. So Mr. Nolander says no because a deal is a deal. That is when Sutter called her granddaddy up to the house. Yeah. So the granddaddy's name was Boy Willie. That's who Boy Willie is named after. So here we find that the these uh, human beings. These black, this black American family becomes just another object which could be traded for a piano and they could be brought back at will, they could be dismissed at will, they could be sold off as at will, they have absolutely no agency. So what Bernie's and uh, Boy Willie are trying to do in the present are uh, in some senses a very similar kind of thing. They are both trying to exercise their agency to hold on to the past or to uh, reject the past. Boyvili is doing to, trying to do, achieve this in a more materialistic sense by again selling the piano, getting the money and claiming the land that once Sutter owned. And Bernice is trying to distance herself from the past by retaining the object but not passing down the memory or the history or the legacy, the, the, his, the, the, the history of slavery that is associated with the object. And she's trying to shield her daughter even from that knowledge. So we find that here all, both these positions are valid in two different ways but we need to perhaps you know get uh, 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 we need to see uh, you know, where these two positions will take these characters as we uh, proceed with the play uh, further. So with this we will bring this discussion to a close and we will continue discussing the rest of the play in the following sessions uh, next week. So I thank you for your time and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.